Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm glad you could be here. Uh, my name is Jim McGlone. I am an urban forest conservationist with the Virginia Department of Forestry. I am also a certified arborist and I have my tree risk assessment qualification. And this afternoon, we are going to be talking about uh, structural pruning using the natural pruning system. That means we're not gonna talk about things like coppicing and pollarding and topiary and all these other types of uh, pruning systems that are recognized. So before we get started, let us remind ourselves that when we prune live tissue, we're reducing the plant's energy production. And this doesn't matter whether it's root, whether we're doing root pruning or crown pruning. If we're doing crown pruning, we're cutting off uh, leaf area. If we're doing root pruning, we are cutting roots and we're reducing the, ability, the plant's ability to collect and move water, which is vital to energy production. At the same time, we are stressing the plant. We are initiating wound closure. We're opening pathways for pathogens. We are potentially changing the UV and volatile organic compound signature, which will attract pests, which means we are requiring the tree to expend energy that it would not normally expend in order to deal with these things. And so it's really important, regardless of what pruning system you're using, that you understand that you are reducing the plant's energy uh, availability and at the si same time, increasing its energy demands. And you need to balance those two things, the reason for your pruning against the loss of energy production. Another thing that happens when we prune live tissue is we are affecting, at least in dicots, and we'll talk a lot more about this, the tree's biological growth control. And I will explain what I mean in a little bit, but that also means that in addition to thinking about how we are balancing the need to prune against the need for energy, we also need to be thinking about how we are affecting the growth patterns of the trees and how we can manipulate that in order to achieve our uh, pruning objectives. So with that, this is a basic outline of what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, we're gonna talk about tree biology. Uh, we're gonna look at the types of, of tissue and their role in pruning. We'll talk about wound closure. I'm assuming that you all understand the concept of uh, CODIT, which is the compartmentalization of decay in trees. We're gonna talk about plan B in dicots. And then we'll get into actually how to prune, uh, which a lot of pruning is planning. And then finally, how to make good cuts. And in the second half, we'll talk about applications. I'll uh, take you through some structural pruning I've done of young trees um, <clears throat> over the years. We'll talk about pruning shrubs because some of the processes and the practices we've used for a long time in pruning shrubs, we're starting to see in uh, doing certain types of pruning with uh, trees, particularly mature trees. Uh, we'll talk about root pruning because we that's important, especially for planting. And lastly, we'll talk about mature trees. And the reason I'm putting mature trees at the end is my understanding from Melissa is she is looking for people who can help do structural pruning of young trees. And as tree stewards, I'm pretty sure you've been told you don't climb trees, you stay on the ground. So I it looks like, Melissa, are you ready to talk a little bit about the program and why we're here? Yeah, so, so um, structural pruning is, uh, so, so, 
Arlington County is, um, we, we are uh, in urban forestry, we steward uh, trees, we care for the tree canopy and um, on public and private land, uh, the way that we do that is through plan review, through tree care and through planting. And um, some of the challenges that we have is that we're growing in, in a forest situation, um, we wouldn't worry about structural pruning at all, but we are dealing with risk in an urban environment. And so um, a, a, a good way to reduce risk is to do structural pruning early in a tree's life so that we don't get tree failure later on. Um, so this is a little bit different than what you have been doing. And, and um, we're focusing more on thinking of pruning as uh, something that's done carefully to, to focus on the, the long-term structure of a tree while not wounding a tree too much. So that's all. I, um, so the whole focus is reducing risk long term. Okay. All right, and we're going to have, and I'll stop at different uh, places where you'll have an opportunity to uh, ask questions as we go through this. So let's talk about tree biology. Um, Hopefully this is review for you all, for all of you. There are basically three types of tissues in a tree. There's meristem. These are the, the uh, cells that are capable of division and differentiation. So we've got primary meristem that makes shoots and roots. It also makes secondary meristem, which is what produces the new wood and creates uh, diameter growth. Then there's the vascular tissue, which is in, um, hardwoods or angiosperms is vessels and in gymnosperms are tracheids and the phloem. And this, these are the tissues that are responsible for moving water and photosynthate and nutrients through the tree. <clears throat> and then there's ground tissue, which is everything else. So these would be the fibers in the stems and seeds these are generally dead cells, as it are the uh, vessel elements. Uh, um, and the epidermal, which is the outermost skin, and is primarily responsible for controlling gas and water exchange. And then parenchyma, which does lots of things, but primarily photosynthesis, carbon storage, and defense. And these are living cells, so we only find them in the sapwood and the living tissues of the tree, but they are non-reproductive. They can't make new cells. In terms of the, the tissues that we're interested in, uh, parenchyma, which makes the secondary chemicals, these would be things like um, nicotine and tannins and salicylic acid. These are the things that protect the tree from pests and pathogens. But remember, the parenchyma is only found in the sapwood. The secondary meristem makes the callus tissue and grows the wound wood that closes the wounds. And the primary meristem is going to make the new shoots and roots that are going to rebuild the energy capacity that is lost when we prune live tissues. And so I've highlighted these as either red or green. The, uh, the red tissues, the parenchyma and the secondary meristem are involved in protecting the tree after the pruning wound. And then the meristem, the primary meristem is the response or the recovery of the tree to the effects of pruning. Okay, um, so let's talk about wound closure. Now, as I said, I assume you all know about CODIT, the compartmentalization of decay in trees, and how trees will build a box around a potential uh, decay point. And that box is uh, primarily physical in terms of tissues that, it, that are created or 
are laid down, but in the sapwood, there's also a chemical defense that's associated with coating. Trees, by and large, evolve to live in forests, and branches are responsible for creating all of the energy that they need and then some extra energy for the rest of the tree. When they get shaded, the tree will give up and they're not producing enough energy, the tree will, will give up on them, the branch will die, and then the tree has to get rid of that dead wood that's attached to it. So the trees have evolved a process to deal with that branch loss. And it's always a good idea to work with the natural processes of a plant rather than against them. And the primary, the primary thing the trees have developed are what are called branch collars, which are visible. And within the branch collar is what's called a branch protection zone. And in this branch protection zone, the tree has, has been storing chemicals. So the parenchyma is making those secondary chemicals and storing them there against the day when the branch dies and, it, and the tree has to get rid of it. And that prevents the decay from getting too deep into the tree. And then the cambium or the secondary meristem there is also primed to make callus tissue and produce wound wood so that it can close over the wounds. And for the most part, the branch collar is visible as the swelling at the base of the branch where I have these two arrows. And so it's important when we prune that we maintain all of this good stuff the tree has done, has evolved to have ready to deal with the wound we're creating with the, uh, pruning. So we wanna make sure we keep that branch collar. Branch collar isn't always visible. It's not terribly well visible here. And so the other thing that we see in terms of wound closure from our perspective is what's called the uh, branch bark ridge. This is where the uh, bark of the, of the parent branch or the parent stem and the bark of the lateral stem come together and if it's a good if it's a good branch union that bark will create this ridge because the, it's growing against each other and it's pushing up where it will not where uh, it's visible so if you're wondering if you got a good branch connection you should be looking for this branch bark ridge you'll see that for all good branch unions bad branch unions do not have it another thing associated with wound closure is something I mentioned earlier called callus tissue. Callus tissue is um, part of the secondary meristem. And if you think about the secondary meristem as more or less a glove that is covering the entire tree right below the bark, if you get a tear in that glove, there will be cells on the edge of that tear and that's where the callus tissue forms. So those cells transform a little bit and they start making what is called wound wood, which is the stuff that's visible on these old pruning cuts, these things that look like lips that go around the, uh, the hole. So people frequently call this callus tissue, but it's not really callus tissue. The callus tissue is the part of the cambium that is making this wound wood, or this wound wood which is different than the rest of the wood on the tree. One of the pruning practices that is very bad that I'm sure you've heard about is called topping. And this is usually done to reduce the size of the tree, but the cuts are made between the nodes and they heal poorly because we just talked about the branch protection zone. Well, there is no branch protection zone out here in the middle of the branch away from a branch union or a, what, uh, or a node. And when we do significant crown reduction, because we have significantly reduced the ability of the plant to make energy, 
that can lead to tissue death, particularly in the root system. These uh, heading cuts that are made between the nodes frequently also, in addition to sun scald and various other things that come from exposing the interior of the crown to the sun, because they don't have any protection. And in some cases, we're cutting through a branch that already has heartwood, then we can get um, heart rot coming in through here because the tree is very poorly adapted to protecting itself there. All right, let's talk about tree biology and what I call plan B in dicots. So you are familiar with the idea that at the beginning of every growing season, plants produce new shoots. This is a viburnum dentatum. Uh, all of this green shoot, which extends off the right side of the picture is new, is new growth that occurred um, just before I took this picture. You can see up here where my fingers are. This was where the terminal bud was last year. And now it has woken up and it's produced a whole lot of cells and extended along here. Now, all plants or all woody plants do this. This is a natural part of growth. But to, un, in order to under, make sure you understand what I'm talking about, I want to diverge real quickly to the evolution of trees or plants. So if we consider three different types of trees, a pine, an oak, and a palm, they are all plants. They are all vascular plants, which is the first uh, division point where we can um, we get rid of things like mosses and planktonic algae. They are both all seed producing plants. So this is where the spore producers go away. The seed plants then are, are uh, broken into gymnosperms and angiosperms. Gymnosperms, uh, is, gymnospermae is literally from the Greek that means naked seed. And what that means is the ovum, the part that will be um, fertilized and grow into an embryo is not covered in a structure. It's lying naked on the some surface of the plant. With the angiosperms, with, which means covered seed, that, uh, that ovum is surrounded by the ovule at the base of the pistil. And so that's the differentiation. So conifers are gymnosperms, flowering plants are angiosperms, and then we further div divide the angiosperms into the dicots and the monocots. And that refers to the number of embryonic leaves they have. But for our purpose, what's important is what happens when those shoots grow. And so the primary meristem, among other things, is forming what are called in dicots, is forming what are called axillary buds. These are suppressed primary meristem. So when you see some of the sprouting on um, trees, that can be a release, a bud that has been suppressed that is now released. So that's primary meristem. Secondary meristem can also form axillary buds. This is generally not good. This is what we call adventitious growth. When they are released, these axillary buds, whether they are from the primary merit, whether they're primary meristem or they're these uh, adventitious uh, growth, form sprouts. Monocots do not have axillary buds. So this is another difference between monocots and dicots. And gymnosperms, particularly the world ones, have very few, if any, axillary buds. And so what that means is when we prune monocots or we, we prune uh, gymnosperms, we don't get sprouting the way we do with dicots. And we need to be aware of that because most of what we're gonna be pruning are gonna be dicots. They're not pines or spruces or other conifers and they're not palms, which is the primary monocot that we would call a tree. 
When we lose the, that uh, apical dominance, it could be because of the removal or death of the terminal bud, which is one of the things we'll do with pruning. It could be girdling of a branch, which would be an indication of something like EAB or a vascular wilt that's affecting the, the, uh, some part of the canopy. Um, and again, those buds, the sprouts can come from either primary or secondary meristem. Frequently that sprouting is a sign of disease or stress, but it can arise if there is a change in sun availability. So if you have two trees growing side by side or close to each other and they're shading each other and you cut one down, it's not unlikely that you will see sprouting from the tree, remaining tree on the side where the shade was coming from. And that's why I call this plan B, but it only exists in dicots. And to give you a visual example of plan B, here is my Amorpha fruticosa. It was getting kind of ratty and leggy. And so my wife and I decided that we would uh, try something called uh, <clears throat> extensive rejuvenation. And this February, I pruned it back to within 12 to 16 inches of the ground. You can see very little, very little in the way of um, small branches and things. This weekend, I took a picture of it, and this is what it looks like. And that is over. So this is what I mean by plan B, and this is what I mean by affecting the growth pattern of the tree. And one of the things that you got to keep in mind when you're doing that, when you're doing any kind of pruning, whether it's structural or not, you want to make sure that if you're going to get this kind of growth, it's because you wanted to get this kind of growth, not because you forgot to prune properly to prevent this kind of growth. And when we get to pruning of shrubs, I'll explain what I did here and how that can apply to trees as well. Okay. Um, topping, again, very bad practice. One of the other things that topping does is it removes all those apical buds or those terminal buds and releases, at least in dicots, the axillary buds. And that can re result in, and you can see some of them here, very poorly attached branches because they could be adventitious growth that's only attached to the secondary meristem. So to review, trees have evolved to lose branches and they protect, so we need to protect the branch collars, which is part of that evolutionary process. We need to make our cuts at branch unions. That's what the evolution of the trees uh, in, implies. Dicots have a plan B that can be exploited or needs to be taken into account. And not all sprouts are bad. Sometimes it's good to have sprouts. So before we get into how to prune, are there any questions? Dean. Does pruning deadwood in any way stress a tree? So that if I'm on a tree and I nope. take out a Remember the number, first thing I said, Dean, was pruning live tissues. Right. All right. So, so, But I'm just thinking that if I come to a tree and I take out a lot of deadwood, does that in any way affect the amount of live tissue I can then cut on that tree? It depends on how you cut the deadwood. But if you're just cutting deadwood, no. Okay. Thanks. So... You can prune all the dead wood you want anytime you want. Any other questions? Yeah, Jim Hugh Robinson. Uh, question, will we be able to get copies of your briefing slides when this is all over with? Um, I believe that's why Nora is uh, recording it. Okay, good. <clears throat> Any other questions before we get into how to prune? Yeah, Jim, you talked about not all sprouts are bad. Mm -hmm. um, is there a, were you going to get into more later about how we determine if it's bad or good to have sprouting on a tree? Um, I would always look at sprouts as suspect. 
And so you want to look and see, can, can I explain why that sprout is happening? Like I said, if you remove, you know, you've got this balance where the, um, the plant hormones are, are keeping buds suppressed. But if there are new resources made available to that, to that bud in the form particularly of sun, um, sometimes they're going to break that suppression and they're going to sprout. And that's part of how the tree reacts to and reaches for those resources. So if there was no sun over there, there's no point in growing branches. And then all of a sudden there's sun. So now we've got plan B. We're going to grow branches over there. Um, but just looking at them, there's no way to tell what caused them. You've got to you know, be looking at it holistically and try and figure out why is that uh, tree sprouting. Well, I'm thinking of a tree planted maybe four years ago that's in pretty bad shape that had a bunch of branches pulled off by kids or something. And it started sprouting much lower. Yes. And I just assumed it was trying to cope with the fact that it had been. Those are good the sprouts. That's the, okay. that's the plan B kicking in the, tri the tree trying to stay alive. <laughs> it's when something is releasing those like emerald ash borer or vascular wilt and you get sprouting because you get that same kind of sprouting from um, uh, what you call it. And technically, uh, I suppose under the circumstances you described, those are um, a stress reaction because it's not emerald ash borer, it's not a vascular wilt, it's a bunch of malicious little brats that are breaking the branches off the tree. Um, but that's, yeah, that you want those. And as I said, sometimes we're going to prune for those. And especially, we don't do a lot of it in, um, uh, in the U.S., but in Europe, they've been doing a lot of, what do they call it, uh, rejuvenation pruning, where they have trees that have, are very old and they've started to get, you know, go into um, decline because of old age. And so they're getting up there into the canopy and they're doing stuff like I did to that amorpha to try and generate more uh, sprouts and more leaf area for that, that tree to work on. But it's not generally right now considered part of the natural pruning system. Okay. And on large trees, as you were saying, I generally leave sprouts if they're happening just to feed the, feed the trunk because, as again, it's a stress response. Yes, so. it, it frequently is, but you do need to pay attention to changes in its environment. Okay, how to prune. So we've been talking for almost 30 minutes now, and I have not actually talked about how to prune. <laughs> and guess what? We're not going to do it yet. First of all, you should be aware there are industry standards for uh, tree care. Um, the ANSI A300 part, I think it's part eight but I'm, or seven, I'm not sure. Um, there are several parts to the ANSI A300 standard for uh, tree shrub and other woody plant management. And this, these are particular standards for pruning. Uh, this is an eight and a half by 11, uh, about 10 page booklet. This is a much denser booklet, which sort of operationalizes what's in this one. This is from the Inter uh, International Society of Arboriculture. And these are are the best managed. And in the NC standard, they do write reasons for pruning. One of them, and this is what we are particularly going to be talking about, is um, training the plant. So this is going to be mainly for providing uh, clearance or good structure. <coughs> Excuse me, if we get into some of those other um, pruning systems like espalier and hedging and topiary, that would also be considered training the plant, but we're not going to talk about those today. 
We also prune to maintain the health of the plant. So it, sometimes uh, there are some diseases that the best way to deal with them is to um, prune them out. A good example of this would be black knot disease in your, uh, particularly your cherries, but any of the plants in the Prunus genus, uh, where just um, sanitation is the, the general term we use for this in arboriculture, where we're getting rid of uh, infected tissue. We also prune to improve safety. So if we have um, poor structure um, or deadwood, we want to correct that or fix it. With young trees, we can usually do that with um, pruning. When they start to get bigger, sometimes um, pruning is not the answer to improving safety. And then, of course, deadwood can be removed anytime, and that could potentially fall out of the tree and land on somebody. So that's another element of improving safety. And if you happen to be uh, an orchardist, you may be pruning to influence flower or fruit production. So sometimes they'll go in after flowering and they'll prune off some of the, the twigs that have flowers on them so they can concentrate more energy in producing fruit on the remaining uh, branches. And there are ways to prune those plants so you get more flowers. There's some other reasons we prune uh, to control the size. Although ideally this would be done at the time of uh, selection of the tree and planting the right tree in the right place. So we don't have to worry about uh, it getting too big for the space. Wind resistance, and this has become somewhat uh, controversial because we're beginning to understand that the old model of the canopy being a single structure that's interacting with the wind is actually thousands or tens of thousands or for really big trees, possibly even hundreds of thousands of surfaces interacting with the wind. And just like drafting behind a, a tractor trailer, they are creating pockets of uh, low energy and high energy that, that will balance each other out in a process called mass dampening. So we do some, we do still prune for wind resistance, but we've got to be a lot more careful than we used to when we do this. It's not just about reducing the overall size of the crown. It's about how we reduce the crown. Because if we do it wrong, we can actually increase wind resistance because we reduce mass dampening. Reducing shade is another reason that people prune. Um, although my solution to too much shade from a tree is not to prune it, but to plant more shade tolerant trees or plants under the, the tree rather than um, damage the tree to reduce the shade. Improving view and improving aesthetics. I can't really speak to these things because I don't think there's anything more beautiful than a tree, at least as far as the landscape is concerned. But there are people who don't share my particular uh, preferences. So how do we do this? Pruning is a process. And notice that the arrows go all the way around. So you observe the plant, then you set your objectives, then you make your plan, and then you start making cuts. And after each cut, you should go through this process again, because sometimes when you make that first cut and you get that piece away from the tree, you look at it again and go, huh, let's do something different. Also notice that the box for making cuts is smaller than observation, setting objectives and planning. And that was on purpose because actually cutting tissue is maybe 10% of pruning. The rest is planning and, and gathering information. <clears throat> so when we observe the plant, we want to 
first, identify the species. What are some of the common pests and diseases of the species? Because that may affect when we prune. <coughs> What's the normal shape? We want to be sure we're applying the right standard to that plant. For example, lindens tend to have very narrow crotch angles, which on an oak or a calorie pear would be an indication of future failure but doesn't seem to be a problem for the lindens. That's just the way they grow. And you need to know that about that, that species to identify whether there's a problem to deal with or not. You also wanna think about what the weather has been, uh, any significant site changes, what are the current issues, what's the current condition of the plant, and what are potential future issues. And those three things about the weather, site changes in the current condition all deal with, all get to what is the current level of stress in the plant? Are we just coming out of a drought or a flood? Have we had a really wacky winter where temperatures are changing by 40 or 50 degrees on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, have we, has somebody just put in a new sidewalk or driveway or something else that's changed on the sites that may have affected the, the tree. Are we seeing indications that the tree is stressed? Because there may not be any current indications of stress, even though there are things that have stressed the tree. That's why you have to think about what's been happening to the tree. And then what are future potential issues? Or potential future issues. This is where you may be looking at a branch and saying, well, it's not a clearance issue now, but a couple of years down the road, it may be. Or um, I, you see a poor branch union in the tree, in the plant. And if you can take care of that with a pair of pruning shears, it's a lot better for the plant and uh, your pocketbook than if you have to come back much later in the life of the tree and use a chainsaw or some other method of dealing with that uh, poor branching. Jim, can I interrupt you for a moment? Sure. Uh, you, went, you talked about wind resistance as something we should be concerned about. This past winter, I think it was January, we had a very heavy wet snowfall. Mm -hmm. And I maintain trees along the Bluemont Junction Trail, and my wife and I went for a walk about the time the snowfall ended. Uh -huh. And we noticed that a lot of the trees had built up a blanket of this heavy, wet snow. Mm -hmm. It was especially obvious in uh, trees that do not leave their, lose their leaves, like uh, holly trees. Mm -hmm. We experienced, actually my wife and I, as we walked down, we actually shook some of the trees to get the snow out of them. Okay. After, after the snowfall, I went back and I noticed that it was the hollies that really took a beating mm -hmm. because the snow caused branches to snap. Right. And one of the problems as I analyzed the situation was a lot of these trees also had a heavy buildup of vines that had gotten into the crown of the tree and basically created a mattress for that snow to lay on. So we have the addition of vines growing into trees and creating problems. And I realized the mattress Master naturalists may get on me for that, but my sense is we should be very careful about allowing the vines to get up into the trees. I know we worry about ivy, that's an easy one, but some of the vines get well up into the crown and create that mattress and uh, make it very conceivable that the tree is gonna lose branches. Well, the vines are a different issue. Um... They're not part of the tree. It's, it's certainly there is pruning that you can do on those vines at ground level to deal with that. My observation also is that that is a problem which is associated with the non-native vines. 
in particular, the invasive ones, things like oriental bittersweet and uh, kudzu and um, porcelain berry that can create pretty dense canopies over the top of the tree. But poison ivy and Virginia creeper tends to stay very close to the, um, to the trunk and they are deciduous. So they're not creating those extra surfaces that the tree has to uh, deal with. But certainly vines is, a, is an issue, but it's a different issue than what we're talking about today. Okay. We're going to be focusing on the structure. Now, as far as the hollies with the broken branches, that would come under the uh, heading of future problems, which is those broken branches are likely to die or not repair themselves. And so then you would start um, looking at, uh, it's not, not quite dead, referral. but it is getting dead. So your objective then would, you would observe broken branches and then your objective is to remove the dead wood. And so those broken branches are, will become dead wood. Thank you. Okay. Yep. So um, <clears throat> objectives. Uh, the one we're most concerned about today uh, is that future tree form. So we're looking at the clearance, we're looking at the structure. This is where we're starting to think in terms of a single well-defined leader, but we're also going to be worried about uh, very vigorous branches that may become too big on one side of the tree and, um, and overbalance it. We could be looking at trying to maintain current form. That's not so much an issue with the natural pruning system. Uh, that would be something more along hedging or topiary, uh, improved flower and fruit production. Again, that's more of an orchardist things, but certainly we wanna look and see, is there any, or we wanna remove any diseased wood or dead wood or soon to be dead wood from the tree. And generally we call that crown cleaning when we're, when we're removing dead wood. Because remember the dead, as Dean asked this question, dead wood does not affect the energy balance of the tree. It's dead, it's no longer using energy, it's no longer producing energy. And removing the dead wood, and if you remember that picture I showed you, can actually reduce the amount of energy the tree has to use to deal with that wound because it doesn't have to pinch off the dead wood with the wound wood closing over it. So then you plan. And when we plan, we're talking about what are we going to cut? Where are we going to cut? What kind of uh, cut are we going to use? Some of you may have heard about the 25% rule. Which, is, which used to be a rule that you should not remove more than 25% of, of living tissue from the crown. That's a good rule or that's a good uh, idea, but it is no longer considered a rule. The, the latest additions of those ANSI standards in the ISM BMP is, has changed that to the arborist judgment. And what that means is then we look at 25, going over 25% of live crown as what in wildland firefighting we call a watch out situation. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but you might want to think it through again, might want to consider maybe changing your cycle because cycle is how often we come back and prune the tree. And as your cycle goes up, your dosage should go down. So if you're going to come in and you're going to make a snip or two with your pruning shears and take off maybe 5% of the live tissue, you can do that more frequently than if you're going to 25%. And this gets to that idea of balancing uh, energy production against your objectives, which is my final point. Don't be in a rush. Allow for that <laughs> wound closure allow for the tree to respond to what you've done. And it may be that you won't have to come in and do more. So it's okay to 
prune the tree every year if you're only making small cuts. You don't have to do it all at once. And I'm gonna show you a picture of what that can look like. So taking your time and so that your pruning plan may be over a course of many years. Once you have your plan in place, then you start making your cuts. And as I said, all good pruning wounds under the natural system are made at a node where branches join or there are visible buds present. In some of those other systems, we will make heading cuts. I would also point out that this only applies to crown pruning. When we get to root pruning, we don't worry about the nodes. But when we're pruning above ground, which is mostly what we're gonna talk about, is you make those uh, cuts at a node where the branches are joining. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I should add, I would like to add, if you don't mind, Jim, sure. that sometimes um, with very veteran trees, and this is just this as an aside, that um, a, a pruning dose of 20% may be far too much. It depends mm -hmm. on the vigor. And so, so, you know, young trees, much like shrubs, can can sometimes I mean a common way to deal with a catalpa is to is to heavily prune it and let it uh, grow shoots and you know um, to pollard it and and uh, and and so so there's you know so much nuance to pruning and um, it's something is, to keep in mind. So Melissa, you just um, answered part of the question, which is. You mentioned pollarding of um, catalpa. Right. That's fine, but that's a different pruning system though than what we're talking about today. Completely, completely different. But and you got to know what system you're working in. Right, right. We're not talking about that. However, yeah. and, some trees can take a little bit more damage than others. <laughs> right. And as I said, your cycle is going to depend on the age of the tree, the health of the tree, and how much you're taking. So you can do that, but you know you can take a lot at once. But generally, that's an indication that you're not coming back for a couple of years, for four or five years, until after the tree has had a chance to react to what you've done. Uh, and that's your dosage and cycle. So those two go together. As dosage goes up, cycle should be going down. As cycle goes up, dosage should be coming down. <clears throat> So, um, yeah. Okay. So now, after almost an hour, uh, we are finally going to talk about actually making cuts. Like I said, there's a lot more to pruning than just applying your, your pruning shears or your saw to the tree. In the natural pruning system, <coughs> we make only two types of cuts. We make reduction cuts, which reduces the length of a branch, or we make removal cuts, which removes a smaller branch from a larger branch. And both are made at branching. So in the picture there, I have what I have considered a bad sprout because it's growing right next to the trunk and would become a rubbing branch if I let it grow. I'm doing a removal cut. So I'm removing that sprout from a... Um, a part of the from a different part or a larger part of the tree and that also gets into the issue of is sprouting good or bad also depends on the species because this is a crab apple and you can see not only a sprout here there's another sprout here these are sprouts this tree is this is a species of tree that just naturally produces a lot of sprouts dogwood is the same way so they're not necessarily bad. It's why they are producing the sprouts that you need to look at. Now, the fact that we are making pruning cuts at branch unions means you need to know the difference between a good branch union and a bad branch union. This picture, I actually pulled up into a parking lot and I looked at this tree and said, oh, I'm gonna go get a good uh, a picture of a bad branch union. I walked over 
And here was this really heavy pronounced uh, bar branch bark ridge. So this is actually a good pruning union. You can see it's got kind of a, a U shape at the base. So it's kind of open rather than coming to a point. Nearby was a tree with a really bad branch union. So you can see there is no branch bark ridge. And not only that, you can see the seam that runs down the tree down to here. <coughs> so if we're gonna do a removal cut, what we would actually do is cut across here and take advantage of the fact that there is bark between these two pieces and use that included bark as part of our wound closure process. <coughs> so like I said, two types of cuts, reduction and removal. And we're gonna talk about a reduction cut first because it's a little bit trickier than a removal cut. What you're doing with a reduction cut, remember we're at a branch union. So we're going to have uh, what I'll call a parent branch, which is the larger branch and a terminal branch or a lateral branch rather, which is the smaller branch. There used to be a rule that you do not reduce to a lateral that is less than one third the diameter of the parent. Again, that has become the arborist judgment because there are some times when you do want to remove, reduce to something that's less than one third the diameter of the parent branch. But what this is doing by making the cut, and you can see in the picture here, this is right after I made the cut. Um, it's not straight across the, the uh, parent branch, it's at an angle. And what that does then is it promotes the terminal branch of the lateral or the terminal bud of the lateral to being the terminal bud of the entire branch. And it allows that terminal bud to take over the suppression of the axillary buds that are in the remainder of the branch. It also allows uh, the branch collar to at least have some influence on wound closure. So this is the cut uh, right after I made it. This is about three years later. You can see I'm getting good wound wood around this. I don't have much decay or any decay in there and I don't have any sprouting around the uh, cut. And then 12 years later, you can see it's starting to close over. Unfortunately, this is a maple. They're not really good at controlling decay. So there is a little bit of uh, decay inside that was made from this wound, but it's still uh, growing well. And this branch is still attached and doing what the branch is supposed to do for the tree. So how do we make that reduction cut? So it's all about the branch bark ridge. So remember, we're doing a reduction cut. So we're taking the, uh, a chunk of the parent branch, the larger branch, and we're leaving this uh, lateral branch on the side. So we start at the branch bark ridge and we visualize, or even if you wanna take a marker, you can draw a line perpendicular to the axis of growth. So the tree is growing, or this branch is growing this way. We draw the line perpendicular to it. Then we bisect the angle formed by that perpendicular line and the branch bark ridge. And we make the cut like this. So in terms of uh, actually making the cut, here you can see I've just visual because I'm going to make it with my pruning shears. I visualize the line with my one of my blades, and you can see I've got an overhand grip in that picture. And then before I made the cut, I rotated down to bisect the angle, and now I've got a handshake grip on those pruners when I made the cut. Now that should indicate that. We just we don't want you to make too steep a cut or too flat a cut there. So, but it's not like you have to get out there with your protractor to calculate how you have bisected that angle. 
you can visualize that rather than just rather than uh, get too hung up on that detail. Okay. Now, hey, Jim. Yes. Jim, I'm I'm confused by the photo before that one of the really. It looked. Yeah, that looks to me like that's the whole trunk of the tree. It could be with the line going across it, and then yep. you were, you would still just go ahead and cut that big amount there well remember before we went to make the cut we observed the tree we set our objective okay. and we made our plan so if in a in our observation and setting okay. the objectives we said we need to remove this then this is how you would do it okay okay <clears throat> okay so yeah, and in fact, in this particular instance, you're correct. This is the trunk of the tree. Um, I have this picture because my wife looked at it and thought there was thought this was some kind of disease or something wrong with the tree. So I got to spend a few minutes explaining branch bark ridges to her. Uh, later, I find out that she likes to walk in the woods because I do stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, but yeah, I, I would generally not recommend doing a reduction cut that <laughs> removes the top of your le of your yeah. um, leader. But imagine you work for the power company, mm -hmm. and that would be a case where your observation and your objectives say the top of the leader comes off because it's interfering with the power line. And I have noted that. Power companies are at least specifying these types of cuts when they're doing their reduction, you know, when they're doing their line clearance pruning. Um, how good they are, I think, depends on who's actually wielding the saw, but this is what they're, they're asking for. Okay? Okay. All right. So one of the things, and this gets to the plan B and manipulating the tree so remember we've got those suppressed buds on the part from the uh that are primary meristem those axillary buds and that terminal bud is suppressing the growth of of those buds when we make that cut the way i showed you that reduction cut what we are actually doing is we are substituting a terminal the terminal bud on the lateral for the terminal bud on the main or the parent branch. And the terminal bud on the lateral is preventing all of those axillary uh, sprouts below the cut from being released. And are those axillary buds from being released. So when we make good reduction cuts, we are going to prevent sprouting. The other thing that those reduction cuts will do is it will reduce the photosynthesis of that branch. And so it's gonna slow down its growth rate. <coughs> and we will talk about reducing the growth rate and controlling the growth of temporary branches later on. But that's one of the things that we're gonna be doing. with these uh, reduction cuts. Removal cuts are more straightforward. We've got a parent and a lateral, and we're just going to remove this, the lateral and keep the bigger piece. When we do that, we want, to we want to preserve that branch color, and we want to work with the evolution of the plants. And again, these removal cuts should always occur at a node. And making removal cuts is very similar to making re reduction cuts. Again, we can visualize if we don't have a uh, visible branch collar, you can visualize that line perpendicular to growth and bisect the angle and make your cut there. And this is what we call the Shigo method. Uh, he was the guy who uh, figured out compartmentalization of decay in trees, but he also came up with this methodology for pruning trees. And this has always been, the, this is the case 
for a long time. However, about, I guess it's about a decade ago now, um, some German arborists observed that we see this frequently when we make these shigo cuts, where you have this kind of little stub of dead wood sticking out at the base of the, at the bottom of the cut. And so the plant has to do more work to close that over. And what they did was they looked at this, uh, this is, I'm not sure how they made this, uh, other than they cut the tree in half with a chainsaw. But you can see here the, um, I called it the book cut because I made this for the master gardeners, but this would be the Shigo cut line. But notice there's a little bit of dead wood there, right? which we can see at, out there. And so what they are arguing now is you should make your cut parallel to the axis of growth of the parent branch and start outside the branch bark ridge. And so it would be a little bit flatter. Now, keep in mind, I am not talking about a flush cut. I'm talking about protecting that branch collar but recognizing that the branch collar is not, especially when it's not visible, is not necessarily quite as far out that, that branch as we uh, normally would say. The German cut, though, exposes more of the uh, area you've cut that has to be sealed. It does, but it doesn't, you don't, not really, no? because when you you're you've got a larger surface here but you don't have any dead wood you've got to grow over so um the area that this thing the book cut is giving you is actually larger because this is going to be dead wood that's not going to be producing the tissue so you've got to go from here up and around okay okay yep and that's why notice the wound wood is not symmetrical around this cut. So this is what happens when you make a flush cut and you remove that branch collar. So this is where we start on the inside, right up against the trunk of the tree and go straight down. And that does make a much bigger wound. <coughs> and you get a lot more decay in here because you cut off that branch collar. This is where they're making that same cut. Notice this is not quite as straight down because the branch collar was visible here. Um, but if you can't see the branch collar, it's better to start outside the, um, the branch bark ridge and cut straight down rather than make that shadow cut because you'll wind up with that little piece that you've got to grow over. Here is, uh, and I didn't realize that these, this is an example. This is um, that, uh, like the German cut, but they've left way too much of, well, they've left way too much of the tree because this is a Bradford pear, but uh, they've also left too much of the branch uh, because you can see the, um, the collar here. This cut was actually made properly where they started outside the branch bark ridge and they cut straight down. And you can see that symmetric wound wood around the, uh, the rest of, or the part of the branch that's going to cover. So you don't have that little uh, chunk of dead wood that you've got to grow over here. Hey Jim, that raises a question. Uh-huh. Let's assume this improper cut is left on the tree. And right. I come back two years later to do further pruning and it has closed over, whether it may not have closed over properly because it's left a stub. Would I be justified in cutting it back to the branch collar after two yes. years? Yeah, because what you would see in two years is the bark around the outer portion of this would have started to die and fall off and you would see all of this would be dead wood so you would actually have it would be like that picture i showed you 
early on of the natural pruning. Yep. Um, just not as long. And in two years, there probably wouldn't be as much decay. And I have a, this also illustrates a reason or a method for getting rid of all the damn pears is if you look at this wood, that's really beautiful wood. And we should start start up the demand for pear wood chests and furniture and make this a valuable resource that people will cut down and mill into boards and then stop buying the stuff after a while. So they won't plant anymore. Anyway, so that is how you make a removal cut. Now there is one other thing, and this gets a little to what you talked about with that snowstorm, you, and that is the shear plane. So here we, this is, this is why I'm not a graphic artist. Here is a tree and here is a branch, which is um, a cantilevered uh, lever attached to the branch. And so what's happening is, and you can feel this part if you just stick your arm straight out from your shoulder, gravity pulls down in the end of the branch. And so the bottom side of the branch is in compression because gravity is squeezing that wood as it pulls down on the end of the branch. On the other hand, at the top of the branch, it's stretching that wood. So part of the branch is in compression and part of it is in tension. And in between, there is a place where it is in either compression or tension, and we call that the shear plane. That's where the uh, force goes from tension to compression. <clears throat> and the problem is, and that's the shear plane. I forgot that was in. The problem is you can have um, an, ex or an explosive failure at that shear plane. And what we saw, and I'll show you a picture in just a second, what we saw uh, after that wet, heavy snow, and this is what happened to those hollies, is they failed along that shear plane. Yep. And sometimes that failure will be complete, or sometimes it will be partial. And I would expect that those holly branches, what happened was the tension wood, because wood is a little bit stronger in compression than it is in tension, the tension wood broke and then there was a split in the branch, probably in both directions. So what can happen is if you start cutting this off, once you get there, the branch splits and it'll tear down here. So we need to be uh, cognizant of how we deal with that. And here's an example of a shear plane crack. This was on my maple after that January snowstorm. It failed and failed in a couple of different uh, directions. I'll show you another one that was healed. If this had been a simple shear plane crack, instead of pruning it off, I would have had them bolt it. Say so that again. Be, what's that? You, you can bolt. You would have thing. sealed that by putting a bolt through it. Did you say that? It's like putting sutures in it. It's like putting sutures in a wound on your on your body. It okay, pulls the the pieces together is, and hurry and it and you'll get um, better wound closure or you get faster wound closure because you're bringing those that callus tissue together. Okay. Uh, if I hadn't done anything, it is possible it would have formed wound wood and eventually closed over this but I had several places and, and bolting it together was not really an option. So yeah, because is. of this, uh, and it's particularly true with removal cuts, but it's also can be true with uh, reduction cuts. We want to use what's called the three cut method. And this is not the best picture, but the first cut goes, uh, you want to cut into that compression wood. Ideally you'll cut all the way to the, um, the what you call it, uh, the, the shear plane, but you certainly want to uh, cut in there at least deep enough that you start to get binding on your saw blade. The second cut is further out the branch, is further out uh, along the branch than the first cut. And that's where you're cutting all the way through. And um, the purpose of that first cut is 
if that shear plane fails, it won't tear down into the branch. And then you come and you make your final cut, preserving the branch collar. Okay. And can you go back to the shear plane? And the, uh -huh. the, re the reason I asked that is I bet I came across half a dozen branches and different trees that had that shear plane split. Mm -hmm. Some of them, one, one branch was probably about six or seven inches in diameter, quite lengthy, and probably had a split, horizontal split, what you call the shear plane, of 18 inches. But it was, it was otherwise a healthy branch. Yep. It was probably too thick for me to go ahead and run a bolt through it. It's not really my task. I'm not an arborist. No. Would you cut that branch off at the branch collar? Would that not become diseased, that split? Not necessarily. Now, left like this, on a maple, it's almost certain you can actually see there was some heartwood rot in this uh, branch already. So that would have just made it worse. And that may be why there was some failure here. Um, <clears throat> there was a carpenter ant nest in this branch, uh, which is an indication of dead wood. But I will show you a picture later on of what can happen if you leave these things alone. Okay. Okay. So at this point, I am going to pause and I'm going to stop this screen share and this, let's see if I can do this right. There it is. This is what I want to, let's see if this works. Um, so this summer, <clears throat> my wife and I were looking at the yard. One of the things, can you hear the audio? Yes. Yes. Okay. We noticed uh, about this dogwood tree here is that this branch was shading the yucca and some of the other plantings we had down here. It's also created a clearance problem neighbor to get by so we decided we wanted to take it off but rather than take it off in the summer while there were still a lot of leaves producing energy for the tree we decided to wait until the fall once the leaves were gone we just I decided we would remove this branch okay so here you can clearly see a branch collar for this branch and I want to protect that. That'll help the tree. Jim, we did not see the video. We only hear Permanent. the audio. So I want to make my final cut right here. The problem Sam, is yeah, that yeah, as yeah, long yeah, as this yeah. branch is, there's a lot of weight out there and the so you said you cannot you can't see the video? That's right. right. We just hear right. the audio. Just hear the audio. Okay. Let's do this. Set that down. Stop that. Back up. And so this summer. Okay, can you see the yes. video now? Okay, yes. good. My wife and I were looking at the yard. One of the things we noticed uh, about this dogwood tree here is that this branch was... Oh, one of the things I want you to pay attention to is while I'm making my second cut, it we do get a sure plane crack. Shading the yucca and some of the other plantings we had down here. It's also created a clearance problem for the neighbor to get by, so we decided we wanted to take it off. But rather than take it off in the summer while there were still a lot of leaves producing energy for the tree, we decided to wait until the fall. Once the leaves were gone, we just, I decided we would remove this branch. Okay, 
So here you can clearly see a branch collar for this branch, and I want to protect that. That'll help the tree heal after I prune it. So I want to make my final cut right here. The problem is that as long as this branch is, there's a lot of weight out there, and the lever could, as I start cutting here, could cause the branch to split or to break down and tear along there. So I'm going to show you the three cut method. And I'll walk you through it and then show you the making the cut. So first cut I'm going to make is on the underside right about here about halfway through. Then I will go around and make a complete cut through and take all that weight off. Then I can come back and safely make my final cut here. So that will keep it, as I start cutting through the top, that'll keep it from tearing down this way. <laughs> you can see how it split. Now if I hadn't made that first cut, that split would go all the way down and tear along the trunk of the tree. And that's why I made the first cut that I did. Now that I've removed all that weight, I can make my final cut here safely. So that's the three cut method. Hey, Jim. Yeah. This is Bob Bessing. Um, when I've done a branch that size, I've typically removed, say, two-thirds of the branch ahead of time, way, way far, far away out of the trunk, away from the trunk. You can do that. And because yeah, it simply reduces yeah. the amount of weight. Yes. And then yes, I, do, I still do the three-cut method, but, but, I, but I just try to get as much weight off as I safely can. Yeah, yeah. and that's going to depend on uh, your circumstance. In, in that case, because everything below that branch was herbaceous growth that had already gone away for the winter and hadn't started to respread. I wasn't too worried about uh, okay. the weight of that branch falling uh, onto the ground. Okay, and the second okay. question was, you're pruning in the fall. And at least winter. Virginia Tech's... Oh, okay, I thought you said fall. When, when was that? That was probably... January or February. Okay. Fine. Yeah. But, um, and we'll talk about the timing of pruning. You can pretty much prune or do light pruning. I wouldn't do this kind of heavy pruning in the growing season, but during the dormant season, yeah. So here is that cut. This was a year afterwards, as they said, not my best cut. There's still, um, a little bit of wood down here that probably should have come off, but you can see it's got, at least in this part, it's got a nice even wound wood. So even though maybe I exposed a bigger area because there's no um, dead wood that the, that the tree has to grow over, it's going to make that faster. We're, we're, and not, then what seeing, happens, we're not seeing the tree here, Jim. You're not, we're not seeing, well, the, we're, we're seeing you, which is fine, but not seeing the okay. tree. Hang on. Um, 
let's try this. There. Are you seeing that now? Yes. Okay. So I need to move this someplace else so I can do this. Okay. So <clears throat> again, this is what's happening as a result of that. Um, the other thing to notice, remember I talked about the, the compression wood and the tension wood. There is your locus of growth. So there's a lot more growth on the bottom side of that branch than there was on the top side. And that's um, the tree dealing with, or that's the cambium tissue dealing with that compression. Sorry, somebody's trying to call me. Um, so that's the three cut method, and why you'd use it. Here's an example of what can happen if you don't use it. To be fair to my neighbor, it is possible that the branch broke somewhere out here and did this because this was after, again, after that January 3rd uh, storm. And so this is what he did to, um, to deal with that broken branch was just cut off there and not try to uh, come down in here. This is a, a really difficult situation to deal with. And this is as good as you can do, probably. I might have made the cut a little more angled here, um, but this is a lot to ask the tree to, to deal with. Now, there is another thing that I talked about. I've talked about the parent branch and the lateral branch because we're making these uh, cuts at the branch node, especially with these removal cuts. And so, we can talk about the diameter of the parent branch and the diameter of the lateral branch. And this cause this ratio is what we call the aspect ratio. So the lateral branch diameter divided by the parent branch diameter. And what that it says is this gets back to that one third rule. So if your aspect ratio is less than one third, you can go ahead and do that removal and not worry too much about consequences. So that was the case with my dogwood. On the other hand, if it's one third to one half, and now we're getting into that watch out situation where we need to think this through a little bit more, uh, you can still make that removal cut, but you might want to uh, consider shortening instead of removing. Once your aspect ratio exceeds one half, you're almost certainly going to have defects. So you really should think about, you really should shorten instead of removing. And if you're dealing with branches that are large enough to have heartwood, which is not the case when we're talking about uh, training young trees, you're almost certainly going to have defects. And you might want to think about either shortening or shortening rather than removing. Because remember, when we shorten the branch or we do those reduction cuts further out in the branch, we're going to slow down the growth of the branch and hopefully get it to the point where we're below that one third aspect ratio. And then we can remove it safely. But when you're dealing with branches that are large enough to have heartwood, you might be thinking about some other structural system like cabling or bolting or something like that to deal with the issue rather than pruning. Although pruning can be part of it if you go out and you start doing reduction cuts to um, reduce the size of that. The other thing is... Question? Jim, yes? can you explain what defects, trunk defects means? Heart rot. Okay. So uh, yeah, basically what that means is you're going to have a big wound and before it can close effectively, you're going to start getting decay in there. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I copied this from uh, Ed Gilman. And so I should probably, that's a good point. I should go back and just say, may result in rot, almost certainly will result in rot. Um, <clears throat> When we're making these proper pruning cuts, we should not be sealing them or dressing them. There are some exceptions where we might want to 
uh, treat the uh, wound area, but you don't want to use the stuff they sell as pruning sealant. There you would be using something more like Lysol where you're applying a, a, a fungicide or possibly a contact insecticide if it, if it might attract a pest that's gonna get after that wound or uh, there'll be fungal spores. You're better off understanding, this is why you wanna know what the species is, you wanna know what the common diseases are and you need to know what the life cycle of those diseases are because in general, you don't wanna prune while the fungal spores of say Dutch elm disease or uh, um, oak, not sudden oak death, um, uh, oak will are flying. The simplest way to deal with that is you don't prune when those spores are out there and moving around actively. You wanna prune when they're not out there. But if you are, if you have to prune, then you might want to treat with a fungicide. And just to reinforce that, this is something I pulled off of the label of a, um, a pruning sealant product. And yeah, this is good. It protects pruned limbs, helps uh, trees and small plants uh, protect against disease. But then you can also use it as a waterproof sealant or in their multiple outdoor uses. This is beginning to sound like what's that product flex seal that guy does those infomercials for. And that's not something you want to put on your tree. So uh, this is the kind of stuff that actually creates decay because it's, first of all, getting in the way of wound closure. And it's also creating a really really good um, environment for <coughs> um, for fungal growth. So again, I mentioned this earlier, your dose, your frequency, and your timing should avoid taking more than 25% of, the, of the, the crown. The more you're taking, the less frequently you should be pruning. The less you're taking, the more frequently you can prune. Um, and the time of year. Now, somebody made a reference to a Virginia Tech publication that lists different times of year that you should prune. What we are finding is we can prune any time of year, especially light pruning. If you to prune in the late spring, early summer, right around this time of year, by the way, happy equinox or uh, solstice, you're gonna get your fastest wound closure because you're gonna have the longest period of time that the uh, tree will be able to, um, to, uh, to close off. If you prune in the dormant season, that may increase spring growth, especially uh, um, for some of the uh, conifers. If you prune during the dormant season, however, for things like maples and uh, birches particularly are uh, susceptible to this, you'll get what's called bleeding. And bleeding is basically the result of the same process that drives um, maple sugar, sugar production. It's just that now it's running down the side of somebody's tree. <coughs> It's not bad for the tree necessarily, but it has um, some aesthetic uh, consequences. And so professional arborists generally don't prune those trees during the, the dormant season to avoid the bleeding because then they get complaints from their clients and then they so sound like they're just trying to um, blow smoke by explaining it doesn't hurt the tree because the client's looking at all the sap coming out of the tree and says, how could that not hurt the tree? Um, if you want to uh, slow the growth of the tree, you can prune in early spring. Essentially what you're doing then is you are pruning off those, uh, those buds that are going to pr produce new shoots and slow it down. 
Um, again, I mentioned the pests or disease vectors are present. You don't want to prune them. For plants that you have, for plants where flowering is important, you want to pay attention to when uh, they're flowering. And as I said, light pruning, you know, just going along and making a few snips with your uh, pruning shears can generally be done at any time of the year. All right, we've been going at this for about an hour and a half. Do you guys want to take about a five minute break? Get up, stretch your legs, take care of all the those things that people need to take care of? Great idea. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I will see you back. Uh, my clock says 333. So we'll see you back here about 340. And folks, I am pausing the recording, but do remind me when we start up again.